Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry for making you all wait a little bit more than two minutes. Um, I have just one very uh, brief thing off the top, and then I'm happy to dive right into your questions. So uh, the secretary will be uh, wheels up a little later this afternoon, heading to Israel and other countries in the Middle East. Um, in Israel, the secretary will reaffirm the United States ironclad commitment to Israel's security and emphasize uh, uh, advancing enduring peace and security for Israelis and Palestinians alike. Uh, throughout the region, uh, Secretary Blinken will discuss the importance of bringing the war in Gaza to an end, securing the release of all hostages and alleviating the suffering of the Palestinian people. He will continue uh, discussions with counterparts on post-conflict period planning and emphasize the need to chart a new path forward that enables uh, Palestinians to rebuild their lives and realize their aspirations free from Hamas's tyranny. Uh, the secretary will also underscore that additional food, medicine, and other urgently needed humanitarian aid must be delivered to civilians in Gaza. He will also discuss the need to reach a diplomatic resolution in the conflict between Israel and Hezbollah that fully implements UN Security Council Resolution 1701 and allows civilians on both sides of the blue line to return to their homes. And lastly, he will reaffirm uh, the U.S. commitment to work with partners across the region to de-escalate tensions and providing lasting stability. Uh, so with that, Matt, you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, just on the trip, real uh, yeah. briefly, what other countries is he going to? So, Matt, uh, uh, I will let uh, the, the travel team announce uh, other, other stops as it relates to the schedule as the trip uh, progresses. Uh, at this point, uh, we'll, we can certainly share that he will be going uh, to Israel, but uh, additional stops are to be announced. Uh, okay. And then on this whole uh, leak document thing, uh, on the in intelligence assessment of Israel's preparations for response, is that going to does that play any uh, is that a, a, a problem for him on the on this on this current trip? Is that an issue of concern? So um, I can't say that it has uh, come up in any of the uh, bilateral or diplomatic conversations um, that we've had. Uh, what I can say is that we have seen these uh, reports as well. Uh, and as the president said earlier this morning, we're certainly concerned about them. But uh, in terms of the specifics um, as it relates to this incident, I will let the Department of Defense, the intelligence community, and DOJ uh, speak to it. And I, I certainly don't expect it to have any bearing as it relates to the secretary's uh, not only his travels, but the uh, the objectives that uh, the secretary is, is is bringing to this to this trip. Okay, thank you. Uh, great, Simon, go ahead. Um, yeah, yes. with the secretary uh, on his way mm -hmm. following last week's um, death of Yaya Sinwar. With the after the death, the administration came out very quickly saying, you know, we see an opportunity uh, to bring an end to this war. Uh, we want to get a ceasefire deal. It, but in the in the intervening time. The Israelis uh, seem to have sort of doubled down on on their approach. You know, there's been a lot of uh, death in northern Gaza. Um, they're also bombing Beirut. Uh, do you feel like that message that this is a time to you know to take advantage of this moment to end the war has been? heard from the Israeli side. Well, Simon, that's exactly why he's going to the region, to have these very important conversations with partners in Israel and uh, counterparts in other countries as well. Let's not uh, forget where we were uh, just a, a couple of months prior in which um, the government of Israel had indicated that it had uh, supported the bridging proposal that was in line with the contours of what President Biden had announced earlier in the spring when we were talking about uh, what was needed to achieve a ceasefire. Uh, uh, in Gaza, uh, and Sinwar continued to be an obstacle. Obviously, uh, we certainly are not going to speculate on um, the the leadership of Hamas or what form that takes, and certainly uh, the same decision that uh, was in front of Mr. Sinwar, the, that same decision is in front of Hamas and whatever its uh, leadership will be in that whether they want to end the suffering of the Palestinian people, if they want to end uh, the suffering that has been brought about them. Uh, 
so we expect the secretary to talk about all of these issues. We feel um, strongly that there is an opportunity to uh, move the ball forward as it relates to getting uh, a ceasefire accomplished. Um, I'm not going to speculate on um, any immediate end product or, or, or outcome, but uh, we feel that it is important to engage not just with the Israelis, but also other partners in the, in the region to continue to have these, um, these important conversations for all the reasons that you mentioned. Uh, there continues to be a need to address the humanitarian situation. We obviously want to ultimately see uh, uh, the violence to stop as well. So these are all things that we'll continue to uh, uh, to discuss. And at this point, uh, just to, so we understand where we are, there, there isn't like there isn't a, anyone who's emerged in Hamas who, who you are now negotiating with through the intermediary? Uh, n not, not to my knowledge, of course. I will let our mediators um, speak for themselves and, uh, and let them speak to what kind of engagements they may or may not have with uh, Hamas. But uh, Matt spoke a little bit about this on Thursday. In the uh, aftermath of uh, Hania's uh, death, you saw there was some sort of um, semi-public process in which Hamas had indicated who its new leadership was. Uh, I have no reason to uh, think that a similar process would not uh, take place in the ensuring time ahead. And you mentioned the humanitarian situation. Um, it seems like things have only got worse in, in northern Gaza. Um, you, know, you had this 30 day uh, um, ultimatum that you've given to the Israelis. I wonder if you can give us an update on uh, have they made any progress towards the, what, the, what was laid out in the letter? So as we talked about um, last week, uh, we have seen some progress on some of these things. We, uh, as we saw, we saw the last week, the reopening of the route um, from Jordan. Uh, we also saw the uh, Eras crossing in the north uh, reopen, uh, talking about some of the uh, efforts that we saw last week. Look, um, certainly nobody in the US government is going to stand in front of you and say that we are satisfied or find the humanitarian situation in um, any part of Gaza satisfactory. Uh, and these are one of the things that we expect the secretary to uh, raise directly and discuss, not just with partners in Israel, but other counterpart countries, uh, on what more can be done to get humanitarian aid into Gaza. Uh, a number of border crossings, uh, to answer your question specifically, Simon, are open. We are seeing uh, truckloads um, enter uh, the Gaza Strip, and we'll continue to press for more. Uh, absolutely more is needed, more food, more water, uh, more humanitarian um, aid overall. Just on the situation in northern Gaza, I, did, I mean, it doesn't seem like the humanitarian situation has, has improved dramatically and there's been a, a, an increase of, uh, of bombings, lots of, lots of deaths reported, um, lots of airstrikes. Uh, I wonder if the, you know, the people of, of Gaza, especially those in northern Gaza, um, based on your rhetoric after the death of Sinwa, I might have thought that this, you know, this spelled uh, positive news, but then the, the weekend probably hasn't uh, left them with that feeling. So, you know, what would you say to those people who are saying, well, why, why aren't we getting uh, humanitarian aid in? Why, why are we still being... Uh, hit with these airstrikes? Well, uh, a couple of things. Um, uh, a couple of things, that, Simon. First, uh, as it relates to the letter that Secretary uh, Blinken and Secretary Austin uh, sent to Israeli counterparts, it had a 30-day um, stipulation, and there were a number of uh, there are a number of factors in that letter, of course, in which that we have not seen the uh, totality of, of, of progress achieved. Uh, that being said, we have seen some positive steps uh, in the right direction from last week, and we have seen some of that continue. Broadly speaking, of course, more needs to be done. Uh, but the broader point here, Simon, is that um, entities in the region um, are, are faced with a choice now. Um, whatever the leadership of Hamas looks like, and Hamas as a whole, they have a choice on whether they want to engage meaningfully uh, in uh, continuing the conversations that uh, had uh, taken place earlier in the year when we were talking about achieving a ceasefire in Gaza. Um, we think that continues to be the best path forward in which will alleviate the humanitarian suffering of the Palestinian people, but also uh, allow the remaining hostages, of which uh, there continue to remain seven American citizens, are able to return home. And that continues to be an enduring priority for us. And I know it is for others in the region as well. Um, 
Leon. Yeah, I understand. So the secretary feels important to continue to engage in the region, as you, as you were saying. What do you think his leverage, or the U.S. in general, his leverage uh, is uh, two weeks ahead of the elections, going back to the region? Uh, are his hands tied? Are, is he going to be listened to? Uh, can anything happen? Leon, I, I, I kind of respectfully disagree with the with the premise of the question, and I'm going to uh, evoke what many of you have heard Secretary Blinken um, say pretty regularly: is that um, you know in this department and in his role as Secretary of State, and I would say that extends to um, all of us that work for him. Um, we don't uh, do or engage in, in politics, we are uh, engaged in policy. And what I can say unequivocally is that pursuing a ceasefire um, as it relates to Gaza, uh, pursuing uh, a ceasefire in Gaza is in the interest of, of course, uh, the Palestinian people, uh, because it will allow an additional influx of humanitarian aid, create the conditions hopefully for further conversations to happen so that we can see a independent Palestinian state and a uh, Gaza Strip that is no longer a springboard for terrorism on the Israeli people and a Gaza Strip that is hopefully uh, unified uh, with the West Bank under, uh, as an independent state. Uh, it is in the interest of the Israeli people uh, because again, for, for far too many years, they have been living under the threat of terrorism and proxy groups and malign actors uh, in the region. Uh, it is, of course, in the interest of the United States, and the, it's in the interest of, the, of American citizens. First, uh, the Middle East region is a region in which there are a number of American citizens who live there and call it home. But beyond that, uh, the United States, the American people, it is in their interest to see a region uh, pull itself out of these endless cycles of violence that we have seen uh, for far too many years that date back further than October 7th. So it's not about leverage, Leon. It is what do we want to see uh, that is the best thing that can happen for the region that is in the interest of the American people. And pursuing uh, a, a ceasefire in Gaza, continuing to have conversations with counterparts of what a post-conflict period can look like, all of these things are in the United States' interest, and all of these things are in the interest of the American people. And that is true, uh, irregardless of um, whatever uh, may come when it comes to our elections. Yeah, I'm not so sure about that. But uh, just to, to move on very quickly, um, Lebanon, do, do you condone strikes against the financial institutions uh, that struck uh, the affiliates to Hezbollah. And there's now considerable, considerable damage in southern Beirut. So uh, is it going to become another Gaza? Uh, look, Leon, we have been um, we've been pretty clear and consistent about the fact that we uh, do not want to see uh, regular and uh, daily uh, strikes um, into Beirut as it relates to these um, specific uh, financial institutions that you're asking about, Leon. Uh, I've seen those reports, and I'd let the um, IDF speak to its current operations. I, from up here, could not. Uh, offer any analysis on what kind of role um, they may or may not have had as it relates to Hezbollah's broader infrastructure, whether it be financial or otherwise. I'm not saying that they did or didn't. I'm just saying I, I can't offer that assessment from up here. Uh, broadly, though, our uh, our call continues to be the same, that Israel needs to do everything it can to not target civilian infrastructure and abide by uh, international humanitarian law. And in all of its operations, needs to take every possible measure to minimize impacts on on civilians and civilian infrastructure. This is something that uh, Secretary Blinken has raised uh, consistently with engagements that he's had with counterparts, but it's also something that President Biden raised with the Prime Minister earlier in the year as well. Nick, go ahead. Uh, there's new reporting that the State Department is investigating an IDF unit for alleged sexual assault of Palestinian detainees. Is that true? And if so, what additional detail can you provide on that? And then separately, just wanted to ask if the State Department is still facilitating flights out of Lebanon. So uh, on your first question, Nick, I just wouldn't speak to uh, deliberative processes in detail. What I can say is that uh, in any country where we have a security relationship, we of course have processes uh, in place to assess and look at things when certain facts are raised or facts are brought to the United States. Uh, in, uh, in, in all these places, it's our obligations to do so. But uh, I, what I can say is that um, 
I have no news to share or anything to announce in the context of any um, sort of policy designation with respect to Israel. Uh, and as I said, um, we wouldn't speak to uh, deliberative and ongoing processes. Uh, and on Lebanon, so uh, I appreciate your your question. Uh, a couple of updates on that. So uh, our most recent uh, U.S. government um, offered flight was on Thursday of this past week, on Thursday, October 17th, to Doha, uh, and we expect another flight to take place on uh, October 23rd, this coming Wednesday. Um, as uh, many of you who have been following this uh, this issue closely, we uh, will continue to organize flights based on demand. Um, obviously, with the next flight being on Wednesday, we have moved away from a, a daily cadence, but we will continue to look at what demand is and uh, make, make adjustments to the contract um, as we need in either direction. And we'll continue to assist US citizens with seats on commercial flights, which are available daily to a range of destinations. Camilla. Thanks. Um, uh, Biden's envoy, Amos Hochstein, is in Lebanon. Uh, he had said um, that UN Resolution 1701 is not enough um, and that Israel uh, and Lebanon need to be working on a, a formula that brings an end to this conflict once and for all. Can you give any more details on what he was referring to, whether that's uh, on the ground forces, Obviously, we know he's talking to political figures, and the goal for the U.S. is to get a political resolution. But is he talking more about the immediate term in terms of troops on the ground, forces? So I think um, mm. I, if, if you look back at uh, uh, Special Envoy Hochstein's statement specifically, what he said is uh, both sides simply committing to 1701 is not enough. And certainly, uh, we would agree with that. What we want to see ultimately in any diplomatic engagement is action. And then, of course, in the context of um, uh, northern Israel and southern Lebanon, what we want to see is the effective implementation of 1701. Uh, of course, a, uh, a commitment to, to such a thing would, would of course, not be nearly be enough. What we want to see is uh, something in action. Uh, but that being said, we are continuing to work with the government of Lebanon, the state of Lebanon, as well as the government of Israel to get a formula that brings this um, uh, this this conflict to an end for once and for all. We are ultimately seeking out a, a, a diplomatic resolution. Our, our North Star and our goal here continues to be creating the conditions that will allow uh, civilians on both sides of the blue line to, to return home. And can I ask about this Axios reporting um, earlier today? Um, there was um, it's reporting that the that Israel gave a U.S. document uh, gave the U.S. a document saying what its demands are for ending the conflict with Lebanon, um, and part of that document was effectively saying that it can enforce, i.e., target anywhere in the country um, as part of enforcing uh, what it, it wants for ending the war. Do you have any so I've around? not seen that reporting, and I certainly uh, am not sure what that document is uh, referring to. Again, in the in the context of Lebanon, we have been uh, very consistent for uh, uh, many many days and weeks now of what it is that we exactly uh, want to see. Uh, we of course um, are not being naive about uh, Hezbollah, and they are in fact a terrorist organization, and they have had a uh, stranglehold on uh, much of Lebanon for 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 quite some time now. And so we, of course, support efforts to degrade them, degrade their infrastructure. We want to make sure, though, that uh, civilians are protected. We certainly don't want to see any daily um, regular uh, strikes of Beirut. And we want to see every possible uh, measure taken to protect civilians. But beyond that, uh, we ultimately want to see a diplomatic resolution, of course, one that is in line with 1701 that uh, we believe will allow uh, uh, civilians to return home. That continues to be our focus. But the U.S. would not be okay with Israel being able to strike Lebanon. I, I, I just don't want to speculate on, around the context of this purported document because I truly have no idea what this um, uh, what this reporting is referring to. What I can say now in the context of the ongoing kind of activity is that we certainly don't want to see any kind of daily um, uh, strikes or action uh, in, in, into Beirut. Certainly, one that ones that. Um, uh, have the potential to impact civilians and civilians' infrastructure on a regular basis. Said, go ahead. Thank you, yep. Dan. Uh, now, you keep insisting that Israel has accepted the proposal suggested by the president on May 31, and in fact adopted in a 
UN, uh, UN resolution, the Security Council resolution on, on June 10. So can we expect that during the Secretary's visit this time around, that the Israelis will, or the Israeli Prime Minister will say he adheres to the proposal as was submitted and adopted by the United Nations? Zait, that is a question for um, uh, for the Israeli Prime Minister's office and the government of Israel, and certainly um, uh, uh, we are not spokespeople for them, and I will let them speak to uh, whatever it is their approach is now in the uh, after uh, immediate after days of, of Mr. Sinwar's death. What I can speak to is what the United States approaches, and that, Zaid, you heard me speak to Leon and Simon a little bit, in that for many, many, many months now, Mr. Sinwar had been uh, the major obstacle to uh, getting to a yes. Of course, um, uh, time has passed uh, uh, since then, and there need to be continuing conversations uh, that need to be had. Details uh, as it relates to the proposal continue to need to be ironed out. And ultimately, this is a decision that only um, uh, the uh, Israelis can make and the Israeli prime minister can make. What, but what the secretary, the message that the secretary will be bringing is that uh, a ceasefire in Gaza, one that ends uh, the conflict, one that uh, allows an additional influx of humanitarian aid, one that creates the conditions for the remaining hostages, including the uh, remaining seven American citizens, to return home. Um, that is uh, in the interest of the uh, Israeli people, the Palestinian people. It is certainly in the interest of the United States and the American people. Uh, and that is what we will work uh, collectively to pursue, but also in close coordination with partners in the region, because the day after period uh, is also vitally important as well to make make sure that we keep the region on track uh, so it stops getting out of these endless cycles of violence. Yes, but since you know it was an Israeli proposal to begin with, you expect that the Israeli government will come out and I'm say, not gonna, this is the proposal Said, we accept. I'm not gonna, I'm just asking I'm you. not going to speculate okay. on right. any right. um, uh, announcements that may or may not come out of this trip. I, of course, have no doubt that you'll be paying attention to the Secretary's trip closely, and I will um, uh, let uh, him uh, and or the government of Israel speak um, directly. Mm -hmm. Well, let me ask you about a massacre that took place on Saturday in Beit Lahia. Uh, may, 100 people were killed, maybe more, many more injured. There was mainly civilians. I know Israel liked to say, you know, under the pretext that there were fighters there, but we have seen, you know, by irrefutable evidence that uh, Hamas fighters fight in twos and threes, as we have seen, and their leader was fighting in twos and threes and so on, because it is more effective and it's safer for them. So why is it so difficult for the United States of America that has always adopted and espoused a high standards on human rights and so on, why is it so difficult to condemn the massacre of civilians in this very case? Uh, Said, when we have seen action that has impacted civilians, when we have seen actions that have impacted civilians in a disproportionate way, we certainly have uh, spoken to it. And of course, in the context of Gaza, we have not uh, we have not been unambiguous about the concerns that we continue to have that about its impact on civilians, both in the uh, death toll, but also uh, in the humanitarian impacts. And these are one of the things that we expect the secretary to raise and continue to engage on on his travels. But you do condemn the deliberate and wanton killing of civilians, don't you? Of course we do, okay. Said. Right. Let, me, let me just follow up on, on this very issue. Your, your ally, one of your strongest allies is Jordan. And uh, this is what uh, uh, Ayman Safadi uh, said uh, yesterday. He said, the horror Israel is bringing on the entire population of northern Gaza isn't human. It is pure evil and war crime that humanity should not tolerate. Do you agree with the... With the Foreign Minister so Jordan, not, or you I've not, ally? I, I've not seen um, Mr. Safadi's comments, Said, and certainly I'm not going to get into a public discussion or speak to private diplomatic conversations up here. What I can say is that uh, we know that the that Jordan shares uh, the United States' uh, commitment uh, of what we want to see for the region, which is uh, ultimately, of course, regional stability and as well uh, protections uh, for civilians. We all have a strong interest in trying to create an environment uh, in which people involved in this conflict can return to their homes and live safely and securely. Certainly, that includes the Palestinian people. And that is something that we are going to continue to work towards. Uh, and it's something that we're going to continue to work towards in close coordination with our Jordanian partners as well. But lastly, uh, lastly, I have uh, 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 on aid, please. Uh -huh. Yeah. Now, just to follow on what Simon yeah. uh, asked. Yeah. Now, your 30-day thing. I mean, Israel banned six 
uh, organization from getting aid into into Gaza. Do you feel that Israel feels that it has this 30 days to do whatever it wants, that it can take whatever, you know, comfort, that it can continue to prevent aid from going in, you know, in the meantime, Said, you I, have 400,000 people that are being starved to death and now burnt to death. Said, I couldn't speak to uh, what Israel thinks or, or, or doesn't think. What I can speak to is uh, the approach that the United States is taking, which is that we want to see um, uh, the humanitarian situation in Gaza significantly improved. And that, of course, um, that 30 day thing that you're referring to, it was a letter from the Secretary of State yes. and the Secretary of Defense laying out very clearly of what uh, expectations we had and what changes that uh, we want to see. Uh, and I'll add, uh, it is uh, simply just a reflection of, of U.S. policy. We are uh, always going to appropriately uh, enforce uh, the laws that we are bound by, which is, of course, that in uh, when we have countries in which we have security relationships with, when we have humanitarian conditions as such, there are certain expectations and metrics that we need to see. And we will continue to push them to see those. And I have no doubt that the secretary will raise this uh, directly. Alex, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, uh, just a few topic. Uh, Moldova, I was wondering uh -huh. if you have anything to add to what White House told us uh, about the elections. Uh, if there's any lesson uh, that you guys have learned about Russian meddling, the tactics of Russian meddling, and any response, any punishment, any, any reaction from the West, we should expect in the coming days. And, 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 and. So I, I certainly, Alex, I would not preview any actions from up here, uh, but we would commend the Moldovan people for their participation in the October 20th election and referendum. And as we uh, approach the second round of presidential elections on November 3rd, we'll continue to support Moldova's commitment to ensuring a credible and democratic process. Uh, as it relates to the second part of your question, we and other international election observers uh, noted uh, some reports of malicious cyber activity, disinformation, um, and other things that are uh, consistent with uh, what we've seen the, the Kremlin do elsewhere and what the Kremlin has supported in its uh, intent to undermine Moldova's sovereignty. Uh, but in, in terms of uh, uh, the, the results as it relates to the referendum, Alex, we also congratulate Moldova for the passage of the referendum ensuring uh, the EU path in their constitution, our viewpoint continues to be that Moldova's future um, is in Europe. Uh, as it relates to these allegations, um, we certainly would want them to be investigated and resolved through uh, appropriate transparent legal processes, but I'm not going to um, uh, speculate any more on that. Thank you. Moving to you, I know uh -huh. my colleagues have asked about North Korea, but North Korea is sending uh, troops to uh, for Russia to fight in Ukraine. Um, the White House told us this morning that they are still uh, investigating that. Well, the topic came up two weeks ago in this room. And uh, I'm just having trouble understanding why does it take this long? Is it an intelligence failure or is it lack of trust in your you know, allies? Is Ukrainian intelligence, South Korea put it out there, it's public. Why is it taking this long? So, Alex, I'm certainly not going to uh, get into or speak to ongoing processes that may exist to uh, verify or ascertain certain information, but it, specifically to, as it relates to the question you asked, we have seen reports that uh, the DPRK has sent soldiers to fight alongside uh, Russian security services. Uh, we're unable to confirm whether these reports are accurate, but if true, uh, it would mark for a dangerous and highly concerning development in Russia's war against Ukraine. And We'll continue to consult with allies and partners on the implications of such a dramatic move. Uh, but, but I want to be very clear about something, Alex. If this is accurate, uh, it would also demonstrate what we would view as Russia's um, growing desperation in its ongoing war of aggression. Uh, it is... Um, not hyperbole to say that Russia is suffering extraordinary casualties on the battlefield every day uh, due to uh, the effectiveness of the Ukrainian military. And if Russia is indeed being forced to turn to the DPRK for manpower, this would be a uh, certainly a sign of, of desperation on the part of the Kremlin. Well, I'm, I heard that line before. I mean, in fact, this is the line we have been hearing for two, two weeks now. Why do you guys want us, us to care about what it would mean other than what it actually will happen, take? 
and how to respond to it. Well, Alex, uh, we're just not at a place to confirm whether these reports are accurate. I'm sorry that that's not a uh, swift enough process for you, but uh, we try to work and act deliberately in the United States. And um, I would just point you back to all the other times that we have offered updates and assessments about Russia's uh, operation into Ukraine and Russia's potential uh, closening of relationships with a with a with an adversary. When we have been able to ascertain some of those facts and we're in a place to share them, uh, we we can and we will. I, I'm certainly not going to get ahead of the process on this one. Jenny, I have a lot of topic. Please indulge me. I'm, I'm going to let Jenny's patiently at her hand. come back to Go me. Go ahead, Jenny. Thank you very much. A couple of occasions on Ukraine mm -hmm. and North Korea. Ukraine President Zelensky and the South Korea's National Intelligence Service released the clear evidence, including a video of North Korean troops being dispatched to Russia, and it was uh, revealed that 12,000 soldiers and the special forces are training at the Sergeyevsky training camp, disguised uh, in Russian military uniform and ID card. But why has the United States not yet confirmed whether this is true or not? So, Jenny, look, I, just to echo again what I said to Alex, we're not yet at a point where we're able to confirm those reports and whether they are accurate. But I just want to echo again that uh, if they are true, uh, it, it, it's, it's two things. One, it is a uh, show of the desperation that the Kremlin has found themselves in, but it would also be a dangerous and highly concerning development in Russia's uh, war against Ukraine. It also would be another uh, example of the closening of relations that we see between between Russia and the DPRK. But again, at this point, I don't have an uh, assessment to offer from the United States in terms of whether these reports are, are well, uh, but If the dispatch of North Korean troops to Russia is true and confirmed, will there be a change, is, change in support from the United States, EU, and NATO? Well, I, I'm not going to speculate at all, Jenny. Look, when we have seen the Russian Federation uh, close in relations with another country or rely on another country for its efforts in uh, Ukraine, and an example that I can think of is uh, the closening of relations that we have seen between Russia and Iran, uh, you certainly have seen the United States take appropriate action, and uh, we will certainly not waver when it comes to the support that we'll continue to provide our, our, our Ukrainian partners. Okay. Last one. Okay, uh, although the Middle East, the although the Middle East issue is considered important, the Korean Peninsula issue is also important. What impact do you think the North Korean military's dispatch of troops to Russia will have on the Korean Peninsula? in the future. I, I'm certainly not going to speculate on what an impact it could have on the Korean Peninsula beyond just saying, again, if these reports are true, it certainly would be another uh, uh, example of a, a reckless and um, destabilizing action that we are seeing the DPRK participate in. But again, I don't want to uh, speculate. Rabia, yeah, you've had your hand up patiently. Go ahead. And, uh, I have a question on Turkey. Yeah. Uh, Fethullah Gulen, the leader of FETÖ, whom uh, Turkey has long sought to extradite uh, for orchestrating the, you know, 2016 failed coup died yesterday. Have you seen the reports? And does the U.S. have any comment on this, considering this issue has been a, you know, major sticking point between so the two countries? I, I, I've seen those reports, but I have nothing to offer. I wouldn't comment on matters involving a, um, a, a private individuals living in the United States. So I have seen those reports, but don't have anything to offer. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, on, on the same topic? I'll, I'll, I'll come yeah. back to you, DR. Go ahead. Has Turkey reached out for um, his body? Um, I, again, we're talking about what would be a uh, private individual living in the United States, so I just wouldn't get into that for uh, privacy considerations. So I will uh, leave it at that. 
DR, go ahead. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Yesterday, the Kurdistan region held election, and you observed this election very closely. So what's your comment on this process? Was it free, fair, and transparent election as you urge it? the political parties for that? Let, let me say a couple of things, DR. First, uh, promoting democratic values is a key priority for the U.S. government as it fosters global stability and it strengthens alliances. Uh, these are things that we think are integral to what our interests are in the um, Iraqi Kurdistan region and beyond. Uh, we certainly applaud the role that civil society and the media had in this election in fostering political dialogue and amplifying the voices of Iraqi uh, Kurdistan region residents ahead of the election. Uh, what we saw is a high voter turnout and an election that proceeded without major security incidents. Uh, we saw some reporting of some logistical challenges at various uh, polling stations, but overall, uh, from our uh, viewpoint, uh, the process uh, went forward uh, fairly, fairly orderly. And our focus now, uh, DR, is that we are strongly urging political parties to engage in a prompt and sustained dialogue to swiftly form a stable and representative government government without delay. We think that is the uh, next appropriate step. Yeah, then uh, forming a government without delay, this is what you are calling for. But as you may know, one of the political parties want enough seats to form that government. So will there be any U.S. engagement with the political parties to come together and form a government without delay? Uh, I'm certainly not going to preview any uh, specific engagement, DR, but uh, we call on Kurdish leaders to find a way to move past their differences and, and form a government. Uh, our view is that there is more that unites Iraqi Kurdistan leaders than divides them, um, and it's, interest in the, uh, it's in the interest of the people to uh, move forward in an inclusive process and form a government as soon as possible. Thank you. I'm going to go to Prem. Is that his hand up? Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, Simon and Said's questions. Yeah. So last week, the U.S. sent that letter urging Israel to improve the humanitarian situation in Gaza and heed international law. In that time, the Israeli military has targeted a child and then bombed him and the people trying to help him. Band aid organizations repeatedly bombed a refugee camp, attacked the remaining hospitals in northern Gaza, killed four engineers fixing water systems, rounded up people, tied them, blindfolded them, bombed an UNRWA shelter, and killed a 59 year old woman as she harvested olives on her land in the West Bank. What does it mean if the Israeli government responds to U.S. requests to follow international law by committing possible violations of international law? So first, Prem, I just want to be very clear that uh, as it relates to the specifics of some of these operations, I will let uh, uh, the government of Israel and the IDF speak to that. The point of the letter also was to provide a timeline of which, in which we uh, wanted to see certain factors as it relates to the flow of humanitarian aid into Gaza and addressing humanitarian concerns addressed. Uh, the timeline for that uh, is not, we are not at the end of that process. And so I am certainly not going to speculate or draw conclusions or assessments on that when um, we are still within that time frame. What I can say unequivocally is that we want to see the humanitarian situation in Gaza uh, addressed. We, as Matt spoke about last week, we saw a couple of uh, uh, benchmarks uh, move forward, specifically the opening of some crossings. That is, of course, a positive step in the right direction. Not at all um, conclusive and certainly not as not at all satisfactory to um, a lot of the things that we laid out in, in, in the letter. There was also a couple of other things that we wanted to see, particularly as it relates to how evacuations are undertook and a couple of other efforts. That work um, it, it certainly still remains, and certainly there is still a lot of work that needs to be done as it relates to addressing the humanitarian situation. And I expect these are some of the specific things I expect the Secretary uh, to raise. And on top of that, uh, we have been unequivocal that as these operations are conducted, that every possible effort needs to be taken um, uh, to uh, uh, minimize impacts on civilians and civilian infrastructure. And if you'll just allow me to, to, to address your, your last point about um, the, the woman who is harvesting olives in the West Bank, these reports are, are incredibly concerning. Uh, we understand that the IDF has taken some additional uh, initial steps, that the officer was suspended. The IDF has released a statement that an investigation has been opened by the military police. The commander has been suspended from her position until this investigation um, concludes. Uh, and our expectation is that Israel uh, investigate this thoroughly, swiftly, transparently, 
and it seeks accountability in this instant as well. And I will just note that um, we it is not lost on our on us that uh, uh, the annual olive harvest harvest is, is is major economic activity to Palestinian people and to the Palestinian economy. And we believe that uh, Palestinians need to have access to their land um, to conduct uh, these kinds of harvests when appropriate. And rem so that reminds me, you know, after the killing of Aishnor Egi um, about a month and a half, two months ago, um, the department mentioned how, you know, it, this shows that it seems that the Israeli military needs to really consider and reconsider its, its rules of engagement. What does it say that not only, of, I, mean, I know you mentioned that there's been accountability for the soldier, um, al allegedly, who killed the 59-year-old woman, but there's that case, there's specifically this case of a child being targeted, and as he calls for help, as people descend upon him to help him, they get bombed. I know you said you won't comment on all of these operations, but is that an operation? That just so sounds like I, a killing. I, I'm not gonna, again, speak to these incidents in specificity, but I can say, Prem, that uh, what we ha said uh, before, uh, it continues to be the case, and it continues to be that we want to see some changes when it comes to uh, military engagement and the rules of engagement, uh, particularly uh, as it relates to the West Bank. That continues to be uh, something that we wanna see. Okay, and then finally, just, just yeah, a yeah. finer point, um, um, you know, the department last week said the reason the U.S. gave Israel 30 days to improve the situation in Gaza was to give them enough time to cure the problem. Um, you just said that this letter was also about affirming existing U.S. policy. So what exactly happens if the Israeli government doesn't heed U.S. policy? 23 days from now, if these bombings continue, these capturings, these killings continue, as they have for the past 380 days, what specifically will the U.S. do? So I'm not gonna just I'm not gonna speculate on what uh, may or may not happen, Prem. I can say, and you heard Matt say this last week as well. We of course will uh, appropriately uh, enforce what U.S. law is. We are bound by uh, the the laws that uh, govern our uh, government, and of course govern the security relationships that we have with any particular country. Uh, I'm not gonna speculate uh, what that process is. There is still quite some time. Uh, before we're at that point, Why we hope that we now? want to. We hope that we don't have to get there. We Why? our hope is that we see some effective uh, remediation in efforts surrounding humanitarian access and humanitarian aid, and we hope that um, we don't have to get to that point. So I will uh, continue to let that process play out. I know that this is something that is uh, important to the secretary, and he'll be raising it with counterparts on this trip. Why has it been forced up to this point? Uh, Good. You mentioned yeah. earlier that um, with regard to humanitarian aid, you've seen some positive steps over the past week. Is this a consequence of the timeline set by the U.S. in terms of improving humanitarian supplies? Uh, you'll have to uh, speak to the Israelis and um, members of their government involved in the provision of humanitarian aid, whether it is a, a, a byproduct of uh, the, the letter or not. What I can say is that outside of, of course, the letter, um, which, uh, you know, as Matt spoke about, was intending to stay private, uh, we have talked about humanitarian aid and the importance of it through um, a, a relevant counterpart to counterpart in diplomatic channels. And so this is a um, round the clock effort, not solely just through this letter. Uh, and so we consistently have raised concerns around humanitarian issues when we have seen things happen, whether it be crossings closed or certain access points not be as easily accessible. Uh, we've raised those directly and we'll continue to do so. So I'm not going to speculate on uh, where those changes came from. It obviously was a, a positive step in the right direction. But as I said in speaking to Prem, um, we want to see uh, additional steps uh, taken. If I can just, uh, on, on, on another issue, yeah. there yeah. are several reports that the U.S. is investigating the actions of an Israeli unit, um, Unit 100, which guards detainees from Gaza. Uh, can you comment on that at all? This is what happens when you come to the briefing a little tardy. I spoke to this question already. So uh, I will uh, just uh, I'll point you back to the transcript, but just say broadly that we certainly would not speak to any kind of ongoing um, efforts that we may have or have not in place as it relates to any country in which we have security relationships with. We just uh, wouldn't uh, wouldn't speak to that. Uh, Jalil, go ahead. Thank you, very much, Mark. thank you very much. First, a quick thank you to the State Department for finally giving me a hard pass. I got it after 10 years, so thank you. Um, well, buckle up, everybody. <laughs> and a quick compliment to you and Matt that these last two weeks before elections are left and you guys are doing a wonderful job, so I just want to salute you on that. Thanks, I guess. Um, Quick three questions, sir. Number one, um, in Pakistan, one of our uh, journalists known, Hamid Mead, is like Anderson Cooper in Pakistan. Uh, 
he had reported many years ago that uh, uh, a big news media owner and a journalist writer himself had uh, paid this much amount. I think in those years it was like four or five million dollars to buy these member of parliaments like horse trading was done. Um, that gentleman was my father, by the way, that he was writing about. Uh, during this weekend, a similar incident happened, but this time the congressman, the female even congressman, uh, whose video I had shared with your colleague, uh, their kids were kidnapped. Even their handicapped kids were kidnapped. While they were standing in the Senate, they were shivering. I mean, I, is I, this the democracy that you have... Uh, is this the democracy so, that you want to see in Pakistan? Jalil, I have, um, I, I don't have anything to, to to offer as it relates to what you what you laid out. If, um, of course, for anything, um, uh, for any kind of kidnapping, that certainly uh, we would defer to local law enforcement. If that uh, is true or not, I wouldn't get into from up here. Okay, Simon, so, oh, just you, one question, please. One more. Go ahead. Two, two more, but one more would. You can do one more. Then Simon's had his hand up pretty okay. patiently an for, for a while now. An Oxford yeah. graduate uh, running the biggest charity cancer hospital, running a, one of the biggest charity university in the country. For last one month, his treatment has been horrible. His two sisters are arrested. His wife is arrested. His nephew is Again, arrested. Is there a question, Jaleel? Are there any human rights that your ambassador tells you that if on such level human rights are violated, do you know what is happening on like normal guys level? Jaleel, we engage on human rights regularly and with all countries with which we have relationships with. Uh, that is at the forefront of our engagements. Um, and in the context of Pakistan, of course, it is something that we uh, raise directly through our ambassador and through others as well. I don't have any specifics to offer. Can I just to follow up uh, a small I, one on Simon's that? Hand up Just for a, a small while. one on that, Matt. Come on. Um, go I ahead. wanted to come back to uh, one of your answers to Leon earlier yeah. on the um, Hezbollah financing. Mm -hmm. so this, this this bank organization, Al Qad Al Hassan, uh, it's been under OFAC sanctions. Just, I just wanted to kind of go back to your your answer to Leon, though. Do you you, you talked about sort of civilian infrastructure? Uh, should be avoided, but if the Israel is, is like specifically saying they're going to go after this financial institution, is that okay under the sort of terms that you guys have set out about this bombing campaign? So, Sir Simon, if there are, of course, um, Hezbollah fighters or Hezbollah infrastructure operating um, from such a facility, that would, of course, uh, we'd support the degradation of Hezbollah and the degradation of Hezbollah infrastructure. Well, the point that I was raising uh, to lay on is the specifics in which how this institution may or may not ladder up or feed into uh, Hezbollah's financial network. I'm not an expert in that, wouldn't be able to speak to that from here. Perhaps. Uh, OFAC, OFAC might be a, a place to speak to, uh, but the broader point that I was making is that even when those kinds of operations are being undertook and uh, those kinds of Hezbollah infrastructures are being um, targeted, uh, that uh, every possible measure needs to be taken to minimize its impact on civilians. But when, when you talk about uh, targeting Hezbollah, does that include this financial infrastructure which also serves civilian purposes it's kind of you know it's 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 straddling a line between uh you know militant militant group and um doing services for the for the public so i guess you've you've given them sanctions for for uh aiding uh hezbollah which you consider a terrorist organization but does that mean banks that that deal with funding for terrorism are now legitimate targets so for airstrikes. So, the, the, look, the, ultimately, uh, Israel is a sovereign country and will make its own uh, targeting decisions, whether they're in any in any facility, in any, and this is consistent, it's been our consistent approach, is that in any facility or um, institution, whether it is um, uh, when there are civilians, uh, every possible measure needs to be taken to uh, protect and minimize civilians and the impact on civilians. Um, however, uh, much like uh, Hamas, 
Uh, Hezbollah is a terrorist group that operates within civilian infrastructure, has co-located itself within civilian infrastructure. Um, and when that happens, um, uh, civilian infrastructure can unfortunately uh, become targets. We want every possible thing to happen, so that doesn't isn't the case. Uh, and that is why we keep coming back to uh, one of the things we keep coming back to, rather, is 1701. Uh, because in that agreement in 2006, um, Hezbollah was supposed to lay down its arms. And had they done so, we would not even be in this situation right now. Uh, so again, I, I, I'm not, don't have any specific thoughts to offer as it relates to this particular institution. Israel will ultimately make its own targeting decisions. But uh, even when um, there are terrorist actors at or embedded within civilian infrastructure, appropriate measures need to and should be taken to minimize its impact on civilians. They make their own targeting decisions, but they're using your weapons. So you do have some uh, legal requirements to, to, to uh, to have some influence on that, but just to just to be clear, what you you mentioned Hamas as a kind of parallel to this, I think it's pretty clear that Israel's approach to Hamas has been every official, whether they're uh, militant, whether they've ever picked up a weapon, if they're part of an organization called Hamas, is a legitimate target, right? That's been their policy in Gaza. I, I'll Basically. let them clarify their 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 approach. So but, it's but not for me to their, speak to. If that's their policy in Lebanon. Uh, you know, Hezbollah is a slightly different organization. Hezbollah has uh, political representation. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just hypothetically there could be people working for this uh, financial organization who have no connection to militancy, and that they've never com they've never committed a violent act. Well, but but are you your position seems to be that. It's okay for them to be... Simon, uh, Hezbollah uh, ultimately is a terrorist organization. Hezbollah is a terrorist organization that has uh, American blood on their hands, it has Israeli blood on their hands, it has Lebanese uh, civilians' blood on their hands. And we, of course, support efforts to hold them accountable, to degrade them, and to degrade their infrastructure. Um, while that those operations are being conducted, we, of course, want to see every measure taken so that s um, impacts on civilians are minimized. I'm just not going to... I'm just not going to, I don't have any other assessment to offer on this beyond that. Jackson, go ahead, and then Thanks, we'll so probably that. wrap. Um, is there any comment on reports of Israeli forces demolishing a watchtower and perimeter fence at a uniful outpost in Lebanon yesterday? We've seen those uh, uh, reports, and we've asked uh, our colleagues in the IDF for additional information. And I will let the um, Israeli Ministry of Defense uh, answer any questions about those operations. But we have been clear uh, with all parties that there needs to be uh, uh, protections uh, of UNIFIL personnel and facilities. Um, UNIFIL operates in Lebanon under a mandate from the UN Security Council, and these uh, facilities and these individuals uh, must not be harmed. And Ita, does the department sorry. have any? Any uh, comment about the arrest of U.S. citizen and journalist Jeremy Lafredo in Israel earlier this month? Last we heard, a district court ordered Mr. Lafredo to remain in Israel until October 20th for police questioning. What's his current status? My understanding is that Mr. Lafredo um, has left Israel. Uh, okay. Ita, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, the Commerce Department today removed uh, the technology company Sandvine from its entity list. Um, citing changes in the companies uh, that the company made to its corporate governance yep. and practices. Now, the company was added uh, earlier this year um, to the list after evidence surfaced that Sandvine technology was used to conduct mass web monitoring um, targeting human, human rights activists. Now, I was wondering whether the State Department shares the Department of Commerce's um, view that Sandvine's remediations were significant enough for this action. So we strongly supported the original um, uh, commerce action to add Sandvine to the entity list in February of this year. That's consistent with this administration's uh, approach to uh, countering the misuse of surveillance and other technologies as it relates to human rights abuses. Uh, and we worked alongside commerce over the past several months to closely monitor the reforms that Sandvine has undertaken uh, in response to its entity listing. And we agree with commerce that um, the significant significant remedial steps uh, to its corporate governance and business practices uh, were um, effective enough for the designation um, to be removed. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.